uh, but Sidani sounds regal and would be amazing to rhyme with. I haven't tried it yet. You know, but it's there. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna start. Thanks for coming in today. Thanks for having me. We're really big fans, and I appreciate you taking the time to come to the house. H- how are you? I'm good. Today was like an interesting, interesting day, but post so? snowstorm, it was it was oddly warm, mm-hmm. oddly warm, and like I have a small, I have a five year old, so like after two days of not going to school and like kind of getting back into the swing of things. It's just like, it's weird. Like we didn't go to school two days last week too because of the storm. And I don't know, it's just a weird, but like cool day. I love snow days. When you have a five-year-old, what's a snow day like? It's movies and snacks (laughs) and... Are you watching the movies with or are you just trying to keep busy? Well, I was trying to keep busy these last two days because I'm in school. I'm taking media communications at Humber and like I've been falling behind assignments. (laughs) So, are you on uh, North Campus or Lakeshore? I'm at North Campus. That's where I went. Nice. Yeah. But um, yeah, so she was watching movies and I was attempting to get work done. How'd that go? Uh, attempting. <laughs> <laughs> attempting to get work done. Um, when, when I uh, heard your song, I forget what song I even heard, but I heard something the tri- off the Triple Nine record. It was like, wow. I mean, there's some ferocity in this. But also what I liked about it for me was it didn't feel like you were trying to rhyme like everybody is rhyming today. Mm-hmm. And I just wondered how you, like, who were your first connections to this genre? What made you musical? And when you're trying to figure out what you're going to put down on a recording, what did you do? Like, how'd you do it? Well, in terms of, like, how I've become a musical person, I grew up in a very musical household. Like, my... Every person in my family had their own collection of music and their own way of like working around and working with the music and like building relationship with the music. So, and I have a lot of people in my family, so I've built different types of relationships with different genres. And um, yeah, I've always been super connected to art because it's been it's been like a constant way for me to purge and get to know myself. Like a lot of like young people use art to figure themselves out, you know, teen angst or whatever you call it. But um, yeah, like I feel like just having so many different musical influences growing up, it really influenced me and in not necessarily trying to like keep up with the status quo and like mm-hmm. what a rapper is supposed to sound like as I'm moving through through the times and moving through trends. Um, And what a woman is supposed to sound like who's an artist too. Yeah, like that's, I don't know, that's always been like a really, I try to separate myself from like, you know, female rapper, female musician, because there's been so many amazing, like it's so tired. There's been countless amazing female musicians throughout time, black female musicians throughout time that it's just like, you know, I could be, you know, both genders, no genders, man, woman, I could be a shoe. I'm just yeah. like, I'm focused on trying to like make something different. Right. So, yeah. But different from what? Um, I don't know. <laughs> different, <laughs> like, different from what, again, like whatever is popular while still respecting the trend. Well, you know, it's interesting because you're right. There's been so many great ones. But when Cardi won the Grammy, mm-hmm. that's the first time. Mm-hmm. That's the first time that happened. That, right? That's a big fucking moment, isn't it? That's crazy. If the Grammy matters, which I don't think it should. Right? But, I mean... But, but to some people, the Grammy matters. It mattered to Cardi, and that's great. Mm-hmm. And I guess, and for representation purposes, I guess that matters too. Mm-hmm. So in terms of what you're trying to, to separate yourself then, is that how do you approach putting your experiences down in, into lyrics? Well, yeah, I feel like it's an it's it's fundamental to my art for me to have an authentic connection to, like, the narrative that I'm sharing. Even if I'm not necessarily sharing my story, there has to be an authentic relationship to that story. Mm-hmm. And I feel like a lot of artists, and it's it doesn't matter, like, you're making art, but a lot of artists don't necessarily prioritize having a relationship with the narrative and I feel like it brings a lot more out of the art like you don't necessarily have to be super technically trained as long as you're 
you have a, a good relationship with the story that you're telling, it, mm-hmm. it brings out so much more. And so what is the story that you want to tell? Um, I'm, I'm still figuring that out. I feel like um, I'm getting to know myself and it's an important story to be told, not necessarily because I'm fabulous, but like- <laughs> Which you are. I should not try trying, <laughs> but not necessarily because of me, but the lived experiences that I have and how many people share them and will share them like as my life changes and like what figuring that out looks like. I feel like a lot of different experiences that I've had tend to be glamorized through art, whether it be, you know, whether it be like people who do drugs or like people who sell drugs mm-hmm. or, you know, just a lot of a lot of narratives and contexts that are associated with like marginalized people, whether that's fair or not is another conversation. But a lot of narratives that are associated with marginalized people are glamorized in ways that are unfair. And I feel like it's important for me to like strip those things down and really add context in ways that are still digestible, which is like why I made triple nine the way that I did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And well, and you know, it's glamorized often because you know, what's that old Mark Twain quote, right? What you know? Mm-hmm. So for a lot of a lot of people coming up, this is what they do. Mm-hmm. I mean, fuck trap wouldn't exist. Mm-hmm. I mean, trap is called trap. Mm-hmm. <laughs> wouldn't exist if it wasn't for people telling those stories. What is the what is the line between telling your story and versus glamorizing a story? I feel like the emotion, you know, like not every song about the indulgence of X, Y, Z has to be like this sad violin, whatever. But at the same time, like there are people who are actually struggling with like opioid addiction, addiction to other, you know what I mean? Things that are very popular in the mainstream or even like if you want to flip it and say like, okay, like. We went through a phase where, like, everybody was talking about Molly and music. How come people never talked about the fact that, you know, psychologists were trying to get people to use Molly in, like, therapy to talk about their feelings and shit? You know what I mean? Like, just... I mean, the concept of microdosing with mushrooms today is becoming a medical thing. It's lit. Right? (laughs) And it changes people's lives, Mm -hmm. right? You know? And, like, just not glossing over so much, Mm -hmm. so frequently, like, the important aspects like the depth of a lot of what it is that we're talking about right you know you mentioned teen angst before and it's interesting how that was a very common phrase for a long time but now everybody's trying to keep teens alive Mm -hmm. and so it's different there's an understanding that's starting to change Mm -hmm. don't you think um with mental health issues with addiction um and teen angst is now called multiple things and they usually have clinical names. Mm-hmm. So there has been a big shift. When did you see that happen? When do you remember that happening for yourself? Oh, um, ironically, after my grandmother passed, um, my grandma died in 2011. And after that, like a domino effect kind of happened in my life where I finally got my own place and, you know, I got a little job and I was in school for longer than three months and, you know, I wasn't getting charges all the time. Well, this and is the thing. Your background, you don't come from an easy situation. <laughs> you didn't have a clear path. No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I wasn't getting charged. I mean, kind of fun sometimes, but you know. <laughs> but yeah, like it, after my grandma died is when like things started to... It's when, like, I was more grounded. Yeah. You know, like, a lot of things were happening, and I was just, like, all over the place all the time. And, like, once my grandma died, things were still, like, all over the place, but it's just in one vicinity rather than every friggin' where. Well, you grew up around mental health and addiction, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. How do you get the tool? Like, how did you get the tools? to start to deal with this? Because I think that's a big part of it is when you can give people tools to figure out their path. And I know you've worked in so many community organizing things that, how did the tools come to you? I think it's important for me to say I got lucky in terms of having a combination of my own personal faculties and 
you know, just knowing how to maneuver, mm-hmm. just knowing how to maneuver through different situations and like analyze and put things back together and take what I need from here and take what I need from there. Like the combination of those two things is what has allowed me to access the resources when I'm able to, to get through certain things. Like, um, I don't know, growing up, growing up in Finch, I went to an elementary school where I had a lot of black teachers. A lot of people don't have that experience. That's a really good point. You know, and like, as hard as it was, definitely like life was not as as hard in elementary school as it was like later on in life, but having that many black people, other black people who were not related to me, influencing me in such a positive way made a huge difference later on down the road. You know, like even when I was in um, middle school, yeah, like I, I grew up having a lot of black teachers and that really made a difference in me getting expelled versus me getting kindly removed. <laughs> Well, it's true because if you went to school that was predominantly white teachers, you would be expelled. Oh. All the time. <laughs> I probably would have gotten ex- school expelled. <laughs> I would have gotten expelled for sure, like by grade 10. Yeah. For sure. Would, let me ask you, this is a question that is based on my own personal experience as well. When you got your charges, were you snarky to the cops or were you pl- polite? I don't think... I've been both. Mostly snarky. I think... Context is important. <laughs> That's true. You know, serious. Yeah. Because like what one person might consider to be snarky, another person might say, you know, this kid's having a rough time. This kid's having a bad day. Right. You know what I mean? And like when I think about snarky, I think of privilege. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. I think about, you know, the background that you're coming from. If, you know, and a lot of the charges that I was getting, I was getting charged for literally nothing. Right. Like, Failure to attend, failure yeah. to appear, um, you know, uh, what do they call it when you break your curfew? Just cur- breaking yeah, yeah. curfew, su- super, super, super stupid shit like that. And, you know, if your family members are the, the one who are constantly, like, putting you in these predicaments, like, you know, the opinion of the police officer doesn't matter at that point, you know what I mean? Because, like, I'm a... 14, 15 year old young person who's constantly being forcibly removed from my home for no reason, not right. because I'm being violent, not because I'm not taking my meds. And even if I was like, where, or, like, even if that was the situation, where's the holistic environment to nurture me? You know what I mean? Like a 15, how often is a 15 year old white boy considered snarky to a police officer, right. regardless of what they've yeah. done? You right. know what I mean? Like out in the country, fucking knocking over mailboxes with baseball bats. Do people do that shit anymore? I, I don't know anybody who's done it, but I grew up down the, like down the street from you, TV. so I didn't see any of that. I watched a lot of TV, so that's that's the story that I'm giving you. No, what I mean by snarky was like, it, because some people, the it's there's fear associated with mm-hmm. that, and I wanted to know if you felt it, if you process it, what what kind of trauma that would have left inside you mm-hmm. having to deal with that, having to see those cars and know that this is, this is, could fucking ruin my night. Mm-hmm. I almost, I hate to say it, but there's like a certain level of like preparedness that comes with being desensitized in, in these living situations and circumstances like some of the first times where I was like violently arrested because it's happened to me plenty of times and it doesn't matter that I'm a girl I've been violently arrested plenty of times before that I've watched guys in my hood had their heads stomped out by police officers Mm -hmm. and like you know these are not the context or these are not the stories that are attached to people like living in Canada but Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it's real. It's happening right here. It's happening now. Now. Right now. Like, right now. But, you know, I feel like n- navigating those situations, knowing that I've seen these things already, it's like, okay, I know that I can't act too out of pocket, but I'm not going to not say something. Like, I right. remember one of the many arrests 
like I was at 31 Division and like these like it was like four or five uh, female officers. They came into the room. They cuffed me and they rushed me. They didn't beat the living shit out of me because I was a minor. You know what I mean? Right. But they fucked my shit up. <laughs> oh, fuck. For no reason. Right. And it's like. They must have been questioning me, asking, okay, what school do you go to? It's like, man, I've been here. I was here less than three months ago. Why are you asking me this? You know what I mean? Again, context. There's some people who are going to say, well, you should have just answered the officer's question. And there's, you know, the small population of understanding people who are saying, you know what? If I was a 16-year-old constantly being thrown in jail for, you know, no real crime, yeah. I'd probably be a little bit upset at these officers too. Yeah. You know? A hundred percent. And this is about understanding, right? And this is, I think, the power, not, you know, the power of art when it's treated as an opportunity. Because mm -hmm. I know it's not your responsibility to tell other people your experience so that they can learn. Mm -hmm. But you have these experiences. And so do you feel any connection to that, that you want to share these things? I mean, it's not everything you wrap up, but it's not all that. But mm -hmm. do you want to share these things? Do you think you, it's important to you to do that? Yes and no. I feel like it's important for me to tell certain parts of my story to give people who are not familiar with these kinds of stories context, but it's not to try and change minds or like change the hearts okay. of whoever wants their mind to be changed is looking for the sources of information and inspiration to have their minds changed. They're out there. They're doing their Googles. They're not looking for me to try and convince them. I'm not here for right. that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think that answers the question. No, that, that works. <laughs> so then when you, I mean, when you get set for this stage of your career, what do you want? I, I just want room to tell many stories and for them to be understood you know like I'm not I feel like it's really important for people to realize that black women black people marginalized people we're not monoliths you know what I mean like it's not just one like one experience one person one sad like I'm a single mom from Jane and Finch snap <laughs> fingers snap fingers like no you know what I mean like I have interests and like you know I like hiking and uh, Alexis on Fire was my favorite band growing up well, and come, they're, like, they're playing here come watch it oh my god yes <laughs> yeah they're playing in the living room tomorrow that's what the setup is come for real <laughs> Oh my god! Yeah. I literally, I shit you not, I have a AOF tattoo on my leg. Come on! I'm gonna show you after because yeah, yeah. there's like, yeah, you have to come to learn. I'm an interesting person with many stories well, to and tell. It's, it's apparent in your work. <laughs> That's the thing, right? Mm. Um, but it's funny that okay, I, it doesn't surprise me that you like hiking or Alexa on Fire, but I think it's funny that it's the kind of thing that people would be find. <laughs> Why? Right? Why? I don't. I don't know. I mean, I do know, but then I don't. I don't understand it. You know, like well, it's fucking media. It's me. It's media. That's what it is. Right? Yeah, it has to be. Mm -hmm. I mean, is it media though? Uh, well, is it still? Can we still blame media? Well, to me, media isn't the news. Mm -hmm. What I, I mean, like I think migos are the media. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, 100%. I think so. I think entertainment and and people are so busy and battling so much stuff in their own lives. People of all backgrounds, even the privileged white person has fucking mental health issues that are that are legit. So they don't, no one has the time or even the inclination or the tools really to sit there and go, I want to understand all things about all people. Mm -hmm. So they just kind of, most people are passive. Mm -hmm. So they're like, oh, okay, so all the music that all, all the young kids are listening to today is fucking Takashi and whomever. Mm -hmm. So they're like, or Cardi, and that's it. Mm -hmm. That must be the thing. Mm -hmm. I think it's, uh, I, we had Charlamagne the God here and he was saying that he approaches white rappers the way police approach black people. <laughs> he doesn't think they're all <laughs> bad, but he just rolls up. But I'm giving you a shake Yeah, down. he rolls up. You know? <laughs> that is a great analogy. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I get it. I get it. I mean, Charlemagne, we all, we all in this position have our own complicated stuff, but, and Charlemagne has his, but that's a great line. Mm -hmm. And I think it's fair. Um, and so, okay, so musically then, so Alexis on Fire, what, what else did you love? I loved a lot of things. Like, I've always had, like, an affinity to house music, thus my last project. But I've 
always like liked a lot of different types of music. Like since my daughter's been born, my radio in my bedroom has been parked on 91.1. Like we only listen to jazz, like nighttime vibes, yeah. you know. I have my Toronto rappers, like specifically only Toronto Hoodman rappers playlist that I listen to when I'm on my way to school. Like who, I listen to a lot of different Who's on stuff. that list? Um who is on that list? We got some little B's on that list. So LB, please edit yeah, out yeah, that I said little B. It's not B, yeah. it's LB. Yeah. <laughs> I got LB. I definitely have some Pressa. I have um some Rexdale guys. I have there's a lot of people. There's like some um Malvern guys. I don't know. I listen to them. I'm kinda old, so <laughs> I listen to the rappers. I'm like, they're great. What's their names? Yeah. I don't know. Wait, wait. SoundCloud is awesome because you could just, you know, it gives you your suggestions. Yeah. You like it. You move on. You it's can't like, trust the algorithm, though. The algorithm is going to fuck you. The algorithm is actually like a sin, you know. Long live radio. Long live human selected tracks. How big was Flow for you when it came out? Oh, my gosh. Flo, for, if you're listening across the country, Flow is this hip-hop radio station in Toronto that was a long time coming. And when it came... It was, it mattered. I feel like this is like such a great opportunity for me to say there's a generation of young black people, young people of color that grew up on flow. And it really shows in how we've developed the culture and how we're also pushing back against a lot of the things that are preventing the culture from developing. You know what I mean? Like, Flow was taken away from us at such like um, such a weird time, but we still managed to do so much in terms of yeah. building up our own, you know what I mean, with literally nothing. And like from OTA Live to, they had this show that used to play Friday nights with, um, I don't remember his name, DJ something, another. Well, and anyway. A and Adrian was on the evenings, right? X was on the evenings for a while. That came later, right? I don't know. I don't know. I remember, you know, I remember Red Fox. I remember, you know, Jen and Mark, of course, Strong, you know. Jen. But who's the guy that used to do the night, Friday nights? I wish I could remember because I'm telling you, whoever used to play Friday nights house like late, like 12 to 1, I listened to that religiously. It wasn't Mastermind. No, no, that because that. His name begins with the M. Yeah. M Rock? No. No. Wait, so what time do you watch it? Listen, at 11 o'clock? Late at night, well, like you've 12 got, to 1. You've got Eclectic Circus. So were you watching Electric Circus before that? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> electric Circus, that's so funny because it's like I feel like I didn't watch as much – I didn't watch as much TV as I listened to radio. Like, Flo had a lot of influence, a lot more influence later on than much did earlier. Because Eclectic Circus was, or Eclectic Circus, Electric Circus had ended long before, like, Flo yeah. really gotten into the, yeah, the swing of things. But much had a huge, like, huge, huge influence on my, like, musical taste, too, because, like, all the different types of shows, like, you know, The Edge, and there was this next... Played one that played late at night and they all played like super weird music. It was like, yeah, like I'm watching that. You know, <laughs> like the songs that my friends can't know I listen to are playing on much, you know. It was so fun to work there too because you, we actually had freedom. Mm -hmm. Like they trusted you to play the stuff that you like to play mm -hmm. on those specialty shows. Uh, and, it, and it really made a huge difference. And, and I think that's what the CRTC kind of let people down by not protecting those voices. Because before Flow came out in Toronto, all we would ever listen to was WBLK. Mm -hmm. And that was very different because the experience in Toronto is, of course, incredibly different. You know, you mentioned your, 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 your kid. You put your mixtape right after you find out you're pregnant? So, no, I got pregnant after <laughs> I put out my first mixtape, yes. But then didn't you pay for studio equipment because you won a rap battle at a contest at like six months pregnant? Yeah. So how So how it went was... I was working out of Urban Arts, which is a community arts space in Weston, Mount Dennis. So I recorded my mixtape there. This is pre-Kafaya, pre-pregnancy. I released my mixtape in April of 2013, I guess, because she was born in December. And literally, like, boom! <laughs> it was like a celebratory thing that went not wrong, but farther than I had expected. <laughs> And 
out came a child. Like an actual person. Like an actual person. <laughs> yes. Shout outs to you. And then six months old, six months pregnant, you win that contest? Yeah, so I was six months pregnant when I did the Unity Festival. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and they had like a rat, like a freestyle battle competition component thing. And yeah, I won that. I got some studio equipment. Yeah, it was pretty cool. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. Does she listen to what you make? Yes, my daughter knows my music. <laughs> Do you hide anything from her? Lyrically or any of that stuff? <laughs> Not really, no. I feel like... I don't play too much censored shit around my daughter. Mm -hmm. Only because, like, we live in such a... I don't even know how to describe the times. We live in pretty wild times. And, like, I mean, if, if we can be, like liberal and open and honest with our children about like um sexuality and you know just how their bodies work and like how to like protect themselves like why can't we be like liberal and open and honest about art you know what I mean and like I don't I don't make music that is particularly like raunchy Mm -hmm. or like you know I'm I'm not playing my pre-club mix for my daughter, you know? <laughs> no, but it's interesting because I, I think, you know, when we were growing up, we, it was an, an impossibility that my mother was going to be a rapper. Mm-hmm. It was impo- an impossibility. She's going to be a hip hop artist. So I only knew my mother in the context that I knew my mother. Mm-hmm. And of course she had her own life and her own interests, as you said earlier. But I think it's really interesting when you have this, when you are performing the impact that it has on this little girl mm-hmm. to see that's what a, a mom can be. Mm-hmm. That's a really unique situation for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's really important to me for her to have, like, not just me, but other black women, other just people in their lives who are pursuing their passions in whatever ways that might look like. You know right. what I mean? Because, right. I mean... I could be, you know, a mom making music on a Beyonce level, but you know, I'm not there yet. So, but it still has like a great impact on her in terms of like what it looks like for somebody to pursue their passions and like how happy it makes them. You know, like my family has always been like on a tip of super dysfunction and just like weird shit. And I feel like me doing my thing brings a certain level of positivity to my family that like, you know, I'm not going to act like I'm Jesus, but, you know, I definitely sprinkled some love in there that's impacted them positively. So, so they've noticed it. They've noticed it. A hundred percent. Yeah. A hundred percent. Well, it's, yeah, well, I mean, it's a fucking challenge. Yeah. It's a challenge to to break out of what you broke out of. But I'm still, doing I'm still it. in it. I'm still, like, definitely trudging through. So you, I love that tweet. Was it a tweet you put up and then you had to deal with really quickly to leave music and focus on front lines? That is a, where are you in that divide? I feel like, I feel like I'm always going to ride that fence. Like music is how I want to do my frontline work. You know, one of my friends responded to my tweet saying that, you know, like my music is the frontline work. Um, yeah, it's really important to me for me to stay connected and stay like in tune with what's like happening in the real world. Cause like just making art can be such a superficial whack process. And like, I, I love Toronto, God knows I do, but like how our culture is affected by classism, it makes it really like unbearable sometimes. And sometimes I just want to say, fuck it. You know what I mean? But then it's like, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I like the glitz and the glamour and the like my pictures comment, please. <laughs> you know? But yeah, like I feel like making sure that I, I always stick to the long term goal will help me to stay creative and stay creative. I won't say always making music, but it will definitely help me stay creative. Yeah, there's lots of ways to do it. Yeah. All right, let's play some songs. Um, your choice is here. Let's talk with the first one. Okay. What do you want to hear? So my first choice is Walk Away From Love by Bitty McLean. Yeah. 
Why this one? So um, I chose this song because I feel like it really speaks to my upbringing in terms of being raised in a Jamaican household and like having a, a really old soul in terms of my musical tastes. Uh, a lot of first and second generation Jamaican Canadians, I feel like what's different from a lot of other people is we have such a wide range of music that we come from. You know what I mean? Like Jamaica has like put out a ridiculous amount of genres from that tiny little island, you know? And like, um, yeah, the song is so soulful and it, yeah, it just really speaks to like how West Indian I am and have always been. I remember being like 12 years old, 13, 14, singing this very old sounding song. And it's like the way you have a bunch of 12 year old, 13 year old, 14 year olds rocking. It's like, what era are you from, <laughs> child? But um, but that's yeah. a big part of the Toronto uh, culture is is that it is uh, West Indian, mm-hmm. it's in the Caribbean. Like that's a thing mm-hmm. which you don't hear in a lot of hip hop in the states. Mm-hmm. No, it's not the same. Not authentically, anyway. I mean, yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Um, you know, you talk about the multiple genres. Everybody just thinks it's reggae, and maybe some people have heard of dancehall. Mm-hmm. Who are here? What are the other genres that you talk about? That you think she's stretching right now? By the way. <laughs> She's like Henry Cavill in my Mission Impossible. She's loading up her fists. It's like I'm loading the information. Okay. So let me see if I can remember more than the ones that you already said. Okay. So you said reggae, dance hall. Those are the two that. Skia, yeah. You have Lover's Rock. You have, um, I need at least two more. Skia, Lover's Rock. You said reggae. Desmond Decker was massive for me when I first heard it, right? Good Scott. So when you talk about Lover's Rock, now you're talking about like... Lover's Rock is more like... <sighs> Lover's Rock is almost kind of like what you're about to play now. Yeah. Lover's Rock, like a Barris Hammond. Like there's different... And it's messed up because like when you go on like a Spotify, you're, everything is crammed into reggae. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's all really different, you know? Like... Sizzla, okay, I'll break it. I'll give like a little example. So if you're going to say Sizzla, Sizzla is like a reggae. You yeah. know what I mean? Barris Hammond is like a lover's rock, you know? Um, do I know any older artists that make skia? I don't know the names of any particular artists that make skia, but like... I mean, the, the Desmond Decker was the one that broke big for a lot of people mm-hmm. out of there, which is amazing. But mm-hmm. he's, he was no longer around, but amazing. You know, he mentioned Sizzla. When I was playing reggae and dance on the show, I would get so much grief from people, and I understand why, because of the homophobia. Oh. Yeah, right, in, 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 in a lot of the lyrics, and it was like, fuck, I don't even know what to do, mm-hmm. you know, in that situation. How do you navigate that? I feel like, for me, when I'm looking at, for me, it's all about context, and it's not necessarily saying that oh you know like they're old people so forget about it don't worry but when we're looking at Jamaica particularly and like a lot of other like colonized places we have to look at the history of white supremacy and colonialism and how that's affected people's views of sexuality and things like homophobia you know what I mean like Jamaica had laws buggery laws you know what I mean from before from colonialism from Christopher Columbus times, you know what I mean? That have been in place and have affected the culture up right up till today, you know what I mean? And I feel like it's really important for us, especially in in the black community, in marginalized communities, for us to pick and choose in the climate of cancel culture who we're going to chastise based on the decisions they made in the political climate at that time. Right. You know what I mean? If Sizzle was out here in 2018, 2019, then, well, you know, you can be a little bit more, well, not a little bit, you know what I mean? The hammer's coming down. Yeah. You know what I mean? The hammer's going to go down on him. So for you, it's the context of the time. Yeah. Right. I feel like that's important. You know, it's not to say that with the content, context means, you know, just, you know, let it go. But that's a very, very important thing to think about, especially when we're thinking about people who have generally like done positive things and had positive messages for the community. That's interesting. Cause I, you know, it's, that's uh 
because I know that if people hear that, there's going to be a group of people who go, that's reasonable. Mm -hmm. But then there are a lot of other people who are going to think, no, no, bad mm. behavior is bad behavior. But bad be just to say something is bad behavior is sort of maybe missing. I, I don't know what it, maybe it's just not as cut and dry for some people. Mm -hmm. It's a complicated thing. It is. And like, again, especially when like we're talking about in the black community, that's not to say every person who's done you know a certain amount of bad or a certain amount of you know what i mean like whether we're going to drop the hammer on them or not but like people are people you know and a lot of us are not born conscious and consciousness looks different throughout the times you know what i mean like where feminism has really changed the idea of what like even manhood looks like in 2018 the effect of feminism 40 years ago, it's going to look way different. It was like cool and hip to wear pants. You know what I mean? So like the expectation yeah. is completely different. You know what I mean? And like, again, context. Sisla was it? A reggae artist in, you know, a, a Oakland, California, during when the Panthers were popping and the Panthers were also talking about rights for LGBTQ people. He was a Rastaman in Jamaica, you yeah. know what I mean? Where things are completely different and yeah. where revolution looks completely different, That's right. you know? Yeah. So taking the good with the bad and also, you know, looking at context. It's like there's some people who will, who will try it and apply that same, you know, taking the good with the bad to People like Hitler. No, that's not. No, that's, that's a stretch. Not, that's, that's a stretch. stretch. That's, that's We're called, talking yeah. about for the good, you know what I mean? Yeah. The people who have like. You're talking about a 22-year-old person who made a record who's at 22. Or, is that how old he was? Oh, I don't know. I mean, most of these guys, when they started, are these men and women, they were young. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, a lot of times people are being held to account for shit they did when they were 25 a long time ago. And I get why, I get why the bad behavior can't be ignored. Mm -hmm. But if somebody's 22... What are you going to do? Mm -hmm. And if, if the, the challenge with cancel culture is, how does anybody grow? You know, one of the most important books I ever read in my life was Monster, Cody Scott's book, of mm -hmm. the gang member who was in jail. I, I can't cancel him. Mm -hmm. He did a lot of bad shit, but I read that book because he grew mm -hmm. and it had an impact on my life. Mm -hmm. People got to grow. But again, context, right? Yeah. Like, so I was talking to my friend earlier who... You know, made mention that, like, you know, in the States right now, there's a bunch of politicians who are getting flack because, you know, some pictures of them at, surface from them in college doing blackface. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's like, is that the type of situation where we're going to look and say, well, you know, they were young? No, this is very different because we're looking at a group of privileged people who grew up in a society where the dehumanization of black people is a part of their culture. Right. So, you know, whether they're part of, you know, the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, that just adds a whole layer, next layer of problems. Well, and also he wasn't in high school, he was in college, and that's very different. College, high school, yeah. point is, you're raised in a culture that is like, you know, founded on the dehumanization of black people to the point where, you know, your extracurriculars are of you doing blackface. Like, find something to do. But, like, <laughs> your, your extracurriculars are doing blackface. Is this the type of situation where we look and say, oh, you know, like, they were young? No, because this is forming the culture. But you could know? he have done 20 years of good work as a politician and changed completely? I mean, again, context. What is a politician? <laughs> Yeah, do politicians do yeah. how much good work does a politician do and wow, i mean that's like a very good well hopefully aoc is going to change the game it forces me to go back and like start pulling up the thread because it's like okay 20 years of good politician work it's easy for a politician to make their dirt look good yeah. you know what i mean so it's like if that's what you that's what you were laying the seeds for in college yeah when i pull up the thread of all your good work what is gonna come out hiding in the fluff. Yeah, you know? that's right. Let's play another song. What else do you wanna hear? <laughs> okay, so. Oh, <laughs> my, my granny glasses. <laughs> okay, so I wanna hear Kanye West, two words. Okay. Yeah. We'll play it, we'll come back, we'll talk about it. Okay. That's Kanye. Uh, is Con is Con you've always been a Kanye fan? I've always been a Kanye fan. <laughs> Always will be. I know. I know. I mean, you want to talk about a guy wearing a MAGA hat meeting with the white supremacist president in the Republican Party. I mean, me as a as an ethnic person watches it and goes, what the fuck? <laughs> I, I don't, I can't tell black people how to feel about that, but it's a thing. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> 
It's a thing. I saw Soldier Boy go off on him, and it was the best. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, he deserves it. Don't know. Yeah, he deserved it. Mm-hmm. But I'm also like super aware of the fact that like yeah, there's a bunch of other stuff, but the simple the simple fact is Kanye West is a black man suffering with mental health issues, navigating the na- navigating media and navigating Hollywood America. So you think he does have mental health issues? For sure. For sure. Like, and I shouldn't say it like so exaggerated, like, oh, oh, oh of course <laughs> Kanye West is crazy. You know what I mean? But it's just like there's a there's a lot of people who I spoke to and it's like they wouldn't even watch it because it's like he's suffering. But also like I know a lot of people with mental health issues who would never Mm-hmm. Put a MAGA hat on. Oh, yeah. Well, so, like, that, that, that can explain some stuff. Mm-hmm. 100%. But not the choice. I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not in his head. I don't know. I mean, listen, I'm no expert, <laughs> but the combination of whatever the entirety of his lived experience is, is, you know what I mean, plus the expectations put on him from, you know, Hollywood, America, whatever, him being a black man in, you know what I mean, the family that he's in, whether we admit to the, you know, the intricate parts of that or not, Mm -hmm. that would drive any sane man bonkers. That would drive anybody bonkers. What? Yeah. Kim Kardashian's husband? I could, you could not train me enough years to be prepared for that. (laughs) It's madness. I think you're right. But I'm sure she's a great person. Don't, but, Don't try me. But when you court, <laughs> when you court publicity that way, mm-hmm. you <clears throat> run the risk of courting disaster. And nobody doesn't know that. So then it comes down to accountability. But mm-hmm. that's for another conversation. Mm-hmm. I want to play another song. What do you want to play now? Okay. So, Guapale, Closer to My Dreams. Why this one? This song just speaks to everything that I'm, I'm doing right now. Um... When I was younger, I used to hear the song play on flow and literally see myself in, see myself in my dream. It's a great manifestation song. And like, it just, it feels, it feels so good. Like, yeah, I can literally see myself sitting at my bed in Finch, listening to this and like my surroundings, pardon me, my surroundings, not necessarily making me feel like a dream was attainable, but like being in the moment of the song, like I was literally closer to my dreams. <laughs> then we're definitely playing that song. <laughs> um, and do you have one more on that list? Or is that that last one? Two more. Two more. Okay, what do you have so the other two are Love Inc., Broken Bones, uh-huh. and Rez, they say. Uh, tell me about both those tracks. So, Broken Bones by Love Inc. Love Inc. is a Canadian house music super duo trio group fronted by a beautiful black woman. And um, yeah, like this song, even when I hear it now, it's just like, I don't drive, but I pretend I'm driving. And it's like <laughs> going through time. Yeah, it's it just speaks it speaks so much to like my own lived experience and like I love having super heavy content on like fun, dancey, you know what I mean? And I feel like that's what house music essentially is, like a house music being born from black people, <clears throat> you know. A majority of music that comes out of our communities is always tied to like some kind of struggle context, unfortunately. And like the a lot of the stories that you're hearing in house music, if it's not like liberation songs, it's like what is what this song is about. You know what I mean? Like crazy. And why Riz? I I've always attached myself growing up to the image of like these super cool like fight the power, fuck the system type black artists, and Rez was one of them. Um, yeah, like indie pop, different, just a different type of a vibe that I've always like, yeah, when I'm done rapping, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> that's what I'm doing. Thanks for coming in today. Thank you for having what me. What a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>